so yeah, thanks everybody. Uh, this is uh, envisioning a design system maintained by the Drupal community. Um, really excited to be here at, at Bad Camp. Um, and uh, even if I don't do anything, you've already been inspired today since you're in the inspiration room. Um, but uh, I am uh, Brian Perry. I am a uh, staff software engineer at Pantheon. I am one of the initiative coordinators for Drupal's Decoupled Menus Initiative. I live in the Chicago suburbs. Um, I like Drupal, JavaScript, and uh, Nintendo. And uh, the new trailer for the Mario movie is premiering today. Very exciting. Um, and I'm sure there will be many memes about Chris Pratt's voice as Mario. Um, also re relevant to today's topic, I own the domain webcomponents.wtf. Uh, I haven't done anything with it. Um, but I think the fact that I own it is still an accomplishment. I'm on the internet in a variety of places and uh, would love to internet with you. I'll try not to stand in front of the projector here. <clears throat> and uh, as I mentioned, I work for Pantheon. Um, and uh, not all, but many of the things we'll be talking about today, there have been sponsored contributions from Pantheon. Uh, a lot of the work that I've been doing since I joined Pantheon is focused on open source projects related to decoupled architectures. Um, and uh, related to that, our front end sites product is in uh, early access. So now uh, you can host your Next.js, your Gatsby sites uh, on Pantheon, which is really exciting. Um, and just in general, thanks to Pantheon for uh, sponsoring for me to get out here. So uh, this talk is called Envisioning a Design System Maintained by the Drupal Community. So let's, uh, in this inspiration room, start envisioning. So uh, yeah, we'll be asking uh, a bunch of what if questions to lead us down the road today. So what if there were a set of Drupal-friendly components that anybody could use, and they could be used in Twig, and they could be used with any JavaScript framework, and it was easy to extend those components or contribute new ones. Uh, it sounds awesome to me if that was a thing. So what if uh, web components could make this possible? And uh, specifically talking about web components, um, you know, whenever you explain what web components the spec is, you've probably already lost, <laughs> but uh, I'll do it anyway. So. You know, this is not necessarily referring to like React or Vue or specific JavaScript frameworks. Web components are a set of web platform APIs making up uh, custom elements, the shadow DOM, and HTML templates. So it's a, essentially a browser native representation of a component or custom element. And it's not tied to any specific framework. So it doesn't matter what framework is super hot right now. Uh, web components will always exist as a core browser technology. So uh, let's actually look at a couple, uh, an example of a card web component in a few different contexts. So um, this is the card component from the generic Drupal web components library, which we'll talk more about. But um, in our JavaScript file, we're just importing the library of components and a style sheet. And then in our HTML file, um, we can use that card component. Uh, GWC-card is the custom element. We're just including it in our markup and passing in a number of attributes to it. The image, headline, body text, um, the link, etc. And then it takes that and renders it as a card, in the style of a card. And it has its own scope styling, as you can see here. Below, there's just regular markup. Um, that has the styles associated, the global styles associated with the DOM. Um, so the styles for this component don't necessarily leak out of it, affecting the rest of your page. Um, all right, so that's just in an HTML document. No, uh, no fancy JavaScript framework or bundler required. Um, this is that same card component in uh, a uh, uh, Olivero theme in Drupal. It looks the same. Uh, the data from Drupal is being passed into the card. Here's a, a quick look at the pieces that can make that possible. So we define a library um, that has our style sheet and our JavaScript file for our components. 
And then uh, in the article teaser template um, is where we're actually rendering out the card and setting all of the necessary attributes um, like we saw before, except we get to use uh, Drupal's twig helper functions to do that. Um, makes it a little bit easier to do it in a Drupal way, get at that data and, and everything. And uh, don't really uh, go into this in this talk since it's uh, breaking news, but there's a, uh, an issue going around um, that is the new, the new hotness uh, about a concept for a future version of Drupal of a like single directory component concept um, that really fits nicely into this. Um, it would allow you know a directory to contain the CSS, JavaScript, and markup for a thing, which is exactly what's on this screen. Um, so I'm interested to see what, what happens there. It could make uh, something like this even more pleasant for front-end Drupal developers. So uh, let's see the same component in a fancy JavaScript framework. So this is a view in this case. Um, just a sample view code sandbox. And uh, here in our script, um, we're importing the components and the style sheet just like we saw in all the other examples. And um, in our view template, we can just use that same custom element. Exactly the same. The styles are exactly the same. It, it, we can use it right in view. Same, same sort of deal. So, yeah, that idea of literally a component that you can use anywhere uh, is, is really exciting to me, kind of always been the dream. <clears throat> so some things that I think are, are pros about web components as, as a technology, they use core web APIs, as I mentioned. Um, they do now have wide browser support. That hasn't always been the case in the, the long path of web components becoming a real thing. Um, they use the, uh, they can, use the shadow DOM, which is essentially like a scoped version of the DOM specific to that component, uh, which can give you a lot more control over styling or even JavaScript events. And essentially, you can play traffic cop as far as what does come in and out of your component. And as we saw with some examples, it really does get a lot closer to that right once, use anywhere uh, dream that at least I've had. <clears throat> Uh, but, you know, not without some cons. Uh, things are definitely getting better. Web components are evolving. Um, but there are challenges. So uh, the, I think a common expectation is that web components are going to be, you know, like React, for example. Um, but as a, you know, lower level browser uh, technology, the, it doesn't have the ergonomics of what you might be expecting as a developer with something like React. So, you know, it doesn't have opinions about Bundling, um, using just plain vanilla web components. There's a lot that you have to do in JavaScript to, um, you know, create elements and, and structure your component. Um, so there are a number of supporting libraries that make it easier. Uh, Lit is one. It's a, a Google project. From my perspective, it, it's kind of one to one with web components in my head. It's pretty close to the spec, but there's a lot of things that it makes uh, much easier. Um, then uh, styling can be unintuitive. Um, especially to someone who is not familiar with the shadow DOM uh, in web components. Um, and we'll look at some examples of that as we go on. It's powerful, but it can also be, it's different from what uh, the traditional front-end developer is familiar with, with styles that are global and affect the whole DOM. Um, yeah, I kind of already hit on this, but you know, it doesn't, out of the box, have the developer experience of a framework. Um, you know, it doesn't have necessarily opinions baked in about things like uh, state management and, and things like that. And uh, there are also some uh, ongoing challenges related to server-side rendering of web components. So, um, you know, this is not necessarily all that different from the JavaScript frameworks, but um, for a web component to mount on the page, you need JavaScript. Um, there's definitely ways that you can structure your web component so that there is content that will load and display without JavaScript. Um, but you have the fully interactive enhanced element. I really don't want to upgrade Chrome. This is uh, two for two on most recent talks where uh, that has happened. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, you need uh, JavaScript. Um, 
There is a, a new uh, enhancement to web components called declarative shadow DOM that actually provides a way that you can uh, essentially have a, a representation of your web component that will render without JavaScript. And then when JavaScript mounts, it will enhance the component. So that's gaining browser adoption. Uh, also, the, the challenge there from the Drupal perspective is that all of the solutions for that are node packages. There's uh, a lot of great tools to, make, to allow you to easily server render web components in that way. Um, but there really isn't, that I can see anyway, a uh, clear solution to how we can do that in PHP or you know, in Drupal, which doesn't necessarily have Node as a dependency. But uh, my personal opinion is that on an infinite time scale, uh, these web components, browser native components, will be an important part of building for the web. Um, but what I don't know is you know, how much they'll evolve along the way. Uh, are we going to continue down the path that we're on now, where this concept just continues to evolve and uh, you know, be enhanced and improved? Lately, I'm getting the feeling that that is what's going to happen. Um, previously, like a year ago, I, you know, I wasn't so confident. I, I do think that some sort of browser-native component is going to be an important thing about how we build front-end sites, um, but you know, was it going to be this one? However, I, I'm also very confident that in the short term, um, web components are going to be a growing part of your, your front-end bundle, your dependencies, um, even if you don't know it. Uh, more and more there are going to be things that you can NPM install that just work, and uh, the whole component or part of the component is going to be based on this web, web component technology. So even if you're not out there trying to, you know, I, I want to get a web component to do this, you may just have it. And it might be something that, you know, just works in your React or, or Vue or Svelte or whatever project. Um, so uh, I have in the past given uh, a talk specifically focused on uh, web components and my experience learning about them and the, the challenges and the tricks. Um, this is uh, a link to uh, a, a version of the talk I gave in the past a couple of days. So if you're interested, uh, check that out. So uh, moving on to another what if uh, question. So. I mentioned Drupal's decoupled menus initiative. Um, one thing uh, that the initiative took on uh, at a past DrupalCon was um, with a new menu endpoint that was built um, to try to get people together to you know, essentially do a hackathon and create a variety of different front-end components uh, that consumed that menu data. Um, we had some built in React and, and Vue, um, but as I was interested in learning about web components, I wanted to see, could I make a, a menu web component? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so, uh, we did, and this is it. Um, so, you know, similar to uh, what we saw before, where we're importing the JavaScript for the component and uh, importing a style sheet. I'll get down on the level so I don't break my back here. And you'll see uh, the component is rendered on the right-hand side. If I expand it, I see uh, items from my main menu. It's in the mobile view. If I change the, uh, so, well, I guess to get into the ele elements here, so the attributes. So there's uh, branding, which is the title of the, the menu. The base URL is the uh, root URL of your Drupal instance that has the menus endpoint exposed. The menus, menu ID is the machine name of the menu in Drupal. So if I change this to account, is that account? I thought it was account. Hmm. Well, there you go. Uh, so here we just see a link to log in. Uh, when we're not authenticated, that's the only link that's in the menu. It respects, uh, you know, uh, permissions and, and all of that. Um, so if we just pass another menu ID, it goes, fetches the appropriate menu, and spits it out into the component. Um, there's also the concept of a, a theme attribute here. So this is horizontal. If I don't uh, pass a theme element, it's just a uh, unordered list. But if I bring back the main menu, you'll see that there still is like light expand and collapse. You know, the idea here is that we were trying to create a component that could be restyled and overridden in a bunch of ways. 
Um, or we could actually make the theme unstyled, which literally just is uh, an unordered list. If, uh, if anybody's looking to, uh, to join, there, there are seats in the front. I won't, uh, I won't bite. Um, yeah, so that is uh, the component that we built. And I, I think uh, the concept of you know, being able to kind of abstract away some of the work of talking to Drupal's uh, API, parsing out that data, um, and just making it a thing that people can you know, plug in the URL of their Drupal site, specify the menu, and you get a, a functioning component is, is really cool. So we started talking about you know, how could we try to build more components in that library. And what we found pretty quickly when we tried to make more things is that some of the uh, approaches that we took in that menu web component, which you know, really is kind of a proof of concept, didn't scale well when we tried to think about a, a whole system of components. So let's look at some of those things that were uh, hard to scale. Uh, one was the concept of styling. So we kept that component really pretty bare bones and provided some ways that the styles can be overridden. Um, so what we'll look at here is the storybook for this generic Drupal web components project. And uh, we'll start by looking at the menu web component that we've been talking about. So. Um, there are a bunch of different ways that we essentially expose styling hooks. I see it's a little blurry here. I don't know if I can make it bigger in a way that will help, maybe a little bit. Um, so we exposed a, a few different styling hooks. So we already saw that there are the different themes uh, that we created an attribute for. So depending on the value of that attribute, it's going to affect the styles that are used inside of the component. Um, there also is a concept of uh, shadow parts. So we, we talked about the, the shadow DOM and the fact that uh, styles from outside can't uh, leak in. So outside styles can't affect the component when you're using the, the shadow DOM for styling unless you allow it to and provide specific hooks. So there's this concept of shadow parts, and you can define essentially any element in your component as a part. Um, so I think the parts here is like menu section and menu item, and then that allows them to be styled from the outside. There's a, a part selector, and you can say part menu section, and that's how we, we make this you know pink, blue background, dotted outline, all that stuff. And then there is also the concept of a slot. So uh, you can there's a default slot, which is essentially just any unnamed element inside of the web component. But you can also create name slots. So if you wanted to have something for the branding like we have here, you can define the slot for that. And then it allows you to pass in any markup uh, for that slot that will then be rendered. And that slotted markup is part of the traditional DOM. So the styles for your, your global page will affect it. So that's a way that you, know, you could have some styling that comes in from outside, uh, another way. And then here, under the documentation, we kind of go into some of these options, um, many of which we've talked about. Another uh, <coughs> common approach in these types of web components is using uh, CSS custom properties, or CSS variables. And uh, the reason that that can be useful is that, uh, so the one ex ex exception to the whole shadow DOM and styling leaking in is uh, things that cascade. So like you know, font uh, declarations and things like that, uh, colors, I believe, uh, do cascade down to children. Uh, custom properties do the same thing. So you can define these different uh, variables that then do cascade into your web component, and you can have the web component take advantage of those variables. So for example, you could set um, a, a font stack at the root of your document, and it will cascade down to everything, including these web components. So that could easily allow your web component to be like, uh, if the document has a font set, I'm going to honor that. And let's see, what else? Uh, we talked about a theme property, shadow parts, slots. Um, you can also, uh, since these are JavaScript classes at the end of the day, 
You can also extend the class um, in order to affect the markup that's rendered out, styling, things like that. That's definitely like, uh, you know, power user territory, but it's possible. Um, and another thing that you can do, uh, we didn't really find this, uh, 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 we didn't really go with this approach in this library, but you can also just use traditional classes. So you can set a class on your uh, component and within your style say, you know, if this class exists, these styles will apply. Um, but again, all of those things really are hooks that you have to define. So um, I'm sure, you know, that the styling and the ways to affect the styling of a web component could be an entire talk in and of itself. Um, I'm sure it was uh, tough to catch all that in the, the run through that I just did. Um, but there's so many options and a lot of them do uh, put too much responsibility, in my opinion, on the consumer of the component. Um, like think of that menu web component to make that thing look the way you want it to, the, to get it to match the rest of your site. It's definitely possible, but it's a lot of work, more work than I would want it to be. Um, so yeah, there are all these approaches that you know, still do require some intent, uh, but are possible. Um, so as we worked on building out more of these components, we started gravita gravitating towards using CSS custom properties Looking at other web component libraries, that seems to be a common approach as well. Um, and we already touched, touched on some of the reasons why I think this makes sense. So uh, CSS custom properties are inherited, so they do pierce the shadow DOM. Um, and it does kind of provide a, a level playing field, because you can define these properties that will, in fact, apply to everything on the page. Um, but you still have to take the intentional step of building your component in such a way that it uses those variables. And uh, related to this, um, something, uh, a library that, that we found and uh, are taking advantage of in this project is uh, open props. So uh, this is my, my personal opinion, um, but I describe open props as kind of uh, tailwind, just the good parts. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that. With tailwind, um, I definitely un understand why many people doing front-end work uh, really like Tailwind. Uh, the thing that I don't really love about Tailwind is the uh, kind of atomic classes, the utility classes that require you to put a whole lot of that in your markup. Reason being for me is just that that's not the way I learned to style things, right? That's not the way my brain works. I can definitely get the job done, uh, but I can do things faster. Um, styling the way that I know how to style. Um, however, the thing that I think is amazing about Tailwind is it has a uh, really robust, well-defined set of custom properties, well, design tokens in the case of Tailwind. So that's really the main thing that OpenProps provides is a really great set of design tokens as CSS custom properties that, you know, rather than having to figure out what all those things are, figure out the naming, um, you know, a package like uh, this one can just use it. Um, yeah, and I think I, I got to uh, a lot of this. So um, they provide styles that can be scoped to the regular DOM or the shadow DOM. That actually was an enhancement that we submitted against the library that they added, which is fantastic. Um, and yeah, all the advantages to variables that we talked about. And by kind of incorporating this library into the generic Drupal Web Components project as a whole, it gives a, a whole kind of well thought out system that these components can opt into for theming control. So let's uh, take a quick look at what that actually means. Actually, I'm gonna do it in Storybook again, and we'll look at our uh, card component, the all, all, always default kind of general example. Um, but basically, uh, the in this library, there are just a set of custom properties that you can allow these components to opt into. And you can then use them in the styles or have them just affect things globally. So uh, it gives you a lot of potential control. Simple example. There's a font family custom property that uses the, the font family values that Open Props has. So I can uh, change this to a serif font that automatically cascades down to all the stuff. 
or I can make it mono. Um, and there's, you know, long lists, but there's uh, so many things that we can do to, you know, we have the basic structure of this card, but then to tweak it um, so that it meets our needs. So uh, there is the, like, heading text. We could make that red. Um, we could do something like uh, add a, um, I don't know, add some padding here to the component, make it even a little bit bigger. Um, Round the corners, give ourselves some border radius. Uh, let's see, what else? There's a shadow here. Give it fancy drop shadow. We could even do something terrible, like, um, yeah, eventually you'll combine things in such a way that you can make something ugly, but um, there's also a set of gradients that are available in open prop. So I can just randomly select a gradient that is going to be very inaccessible. Um, can I land on one that's kind of OK? That's kind of OK. Um, so, obviously, uh, you know, made uh, quite a lot of tweaks to this card. Still the same general structure, um, but those are all just custom properties that this card can take advantage of, and you can set them at whatever level you want. You can set those custom properties at the scope of this instance of a card. Uh, you can set it for all cards. You could also set them at the, the root of your DOM and have them cascade all the way down. So, you know, for example, if you wanted all the fonts to be mono, um, you know, for all of these components, you can just set that at the root, and it'll just be taken care of. So, um, you know, thanks to a system like this, I feel like this makes it a lot more achievable for a library like this to have ways to affect the styling to better match an application, rather than essentially having to have, you know, custom theme controls in every single component. Took, took a while to get there, but uh, I think it's pretty cool. Um, and let's look at one more quick uh, example of this in practice. Um, so this is uh, a view, the same view example that we saw before that renders the card. You know, if you look carefully, if you have your, your front end goggles on, maybe a little harder to see in this uh, screen, but uh, the font stack doesn't quite match, right? Uh, the default fonts are different from the view fonts. So we have that custom property, font family, and we can just set it to match the font family that the rest of the app is using. And now it matches the rest of the view app. It all cascades down. You know, we're setting that at the root of the app. So um, any other components in this library that are used would pick up the same stuff. Um, so uh, it's a, you know, a nice uh, low effort shortcut to being able to make these fit into the style of your app. Uh, so um, another what if question, what if these components could work with uh, any data? Um, but optionally knew a few things uh, about Drupal. So, um, you know, we have some like higher level components that we've worked on, like cards or a hero. Um, within those, some lower level things like links and images. Um, so let's take a look at the link component. For a second here. So it's a link. Uh, not all that exciting. It does have all of those uh, styling controls that we talked about. Um, uh, you can pass in. Um, you know, the different attributes of a link, href, title, rel, target, etc. cetera. Um, and it accepts uh, a slot as well. There's not a whole lot of value necessarily in, in using this link component because you can just, you know, use a regular link tag. However, um, once we start to layer on uh, some light knowledge of the structure of data that comes from Drupal, I feel like something like this could be useful. So uh, there's a couple of examples here that use data that comes from Drupal. So this is just the, uh, an example of the output of a link field from JSON API. So you know, we have the URI, title, um, and there's a couple of different examples. Like what, what does it look like if it's for a reference entity? What does it look like if it's a link that points outward? Um, so you'll see here that we don't manually pass in href for any of that stuff. We just pass in that data object, 
and it's still possible for us to render our link with data from Drupal. So hopefully here that makes it a little bit easier to you know, take fields that come from Drupal with a specific structure and use them alongside these components, where otherwise there would probably have to be some work that you have to do uh, either in like top level state management or within the component to kind of parse that out and get the individual pieces and slot them into all of the attributes. Um, you know, I don't think this is something that would apply to all components, but for some of these more atomic elements, like a link or an image or things like that, I think this could be really useful. So um, let's look a, a little bit more about what's happening behind the scenes here. Um, it's uh, surprisingly somewhat uncomplicated. So in the component, uh, there is a render method that renders out the markup. And uh, if the data attribute exists, if we're passing in data, then it runs that process data method. And if not, it will just return the markup and use the attributes that exist, like href, target, etc. So if we look at the process data um, method, really simple. You know, there's definitely some ways that we might be able to abstract this out, make it a little bit smarter. But all it does is it looks at that data object, and if it has a URI, it does a, a, some light processing on it. So if it's prefixed with entity or internal, we need to make some adjustments to make it an actual link that can be used. Uh, if the title exists in that object, it sets the title attribute. And, and then when it goes back to the render method, it will just use those things if they've been set. So that's starting to get a little bit at the, the data aspect of this. But um, another thing that we ran into pretty quickly looking at these components is, you know, what if we wanted to manage application state across a variety of these components rather than like you know thinking of the one example of just the menu component. Um, so uh, remind everybody of the menu component here and you know all you have to do is pass in uh, you know essentially a base URL and the menu ID and this component does the work of talking to Drupal, getting the stuff, parsing it out, rendering it as a menu. Which is great. Um, and uh, here is a little bit more detail on what's actually happening behind the scenes. Um, so one of the lifecycle hooks, uh, when the component mounts, calls this fetch data method. And uh, you know, not the most complicated JavaScript uh, in the world here, but it uh, using the base URL and the menu ID, it structures, uh, it determines the endpoint that it needs to talk to <coughs> for the core's upcoming menu endpoint. And then it just uses JavaScript fetch to call that endpoint, get the data back. There's light error handling. And then it also uh, processes and parses the response so that it is a nice hierarchical structure uh, that you can use. So again, not, you know, not a ton of uh, logic or JavaScript here, but you know, some, and it's all embedded within the component. But really quickly, as we tried to apply that in other places, that concept just doesn't scale somewhat, obviously. So think of the card that we saw before. If, you've got, uh, if you take this approach and you've got one card on the page, that's one uh, fetch request, and you might already have one for your menu. If you've got 10 cards in a grid, that's 10 of them. Uh, if you have uh, 100 cards or some sort of auto scroll, that starts to get pretty problematic. Um, and really what you want is you know, a place where this data can live, that all of the components can access and share. Um, so that kind of uh, led me on a, a pretty long uh, tangent away from this project, um, working on a project uh, called Drupal State. And um, this is another thing that I've given a, a full uh, talk on at uh, past uh, DrupalCon. So there's a link there if you want to learn more. But at the highest level, it is, uh, you know, it's a library that makes it uh, easier to communicate with JSON API and uh, has lightweight uh, state management. So it's uh, framework agnostic, so uh, it works in any JavaScript framework or no JavaScript framework at all, works on the server and the client, um, and uh, at its like, highest level, it will, uh, if you ask for an object from Drupal's API, it will first check local state to see if it's there. 
And then if not, it will uh, request it from Drupal's uh, JSON API. And then if you ask for it again in the lifecycle of uh, the app, it will get it from local storage if it exists. So that'll cut down on your API calls. And also, by default, it represents the data in a uh, flattened, deserialized structure. Uh, JSON API still is uh, a little nested, has some Drupalisms. It's not necessarily what JavaScript developers who are either not familiar with Drupal or not familiar with JSON API expect. Um, so that makes it a little bit easier to work with, in, in my opinion. So this is a, a really super quick example of what that actually looks like in practice. So uh, we can import uh, Drupal state and then create an instance of the store. So we provide an API base. Um, it's also possible to provide an API prefix. It's optional. By default, it's JSON API. But if you have your API under some other prefix, you can specify it. There's a, a handful of other options that you can use here, but that's enough to get you going. And then if we wanted to get uh, recipes from the uh, a, a Drupal site that has the uh, umami demo data, it's as simple as uh, creating a constant and then uh, store, get object, and then providing the, uh, the object name, so a node recipe in this case. Um, and what that does behind the scenes, it uh, calls out to the root of JSON API, it figures out what the endpoint for node recipe is, and then it will uh, parse all of that data and return it um, and store it in local state. So you'll see here that the result on the right-hand side, it's nice and flat. Uh, things aren't nested under attributes or uh, includes like in the traditional JSON API response. <coughs> and then if we uh, ask for a particular recipe after doing that, so we provide uh, an ID here, it's just gonna get that from uh, the local store um, since it already has that uh, recipe with that ID, and it doesn't have to make another call to Drupal. So, um, you know, that utility in and of itself um, helps for uh, a library like this. You know, at the time that I, as we started working on Drupal State, there really wasn't, and there still really isn't, uh, any sort of common set of utilities for talking to JSON API. There's nothing under the Drupal namespace on NPM. There are a handful of different clients, um, but they all do things differently. Some have thing, uh, assumptions baked in for specific JavaScript frameworks. Um, but you know, having this utility that can interface in a reliable way with JSON API uh, opens up the possibilities for a design system like this. So, uh, the next step there is, you know, how can we continue to make it easier to get data from Drupal when working with components in the system? So what if we created a web com component that could just source data from Drupal? And with um, uh, Drupal state as a dependency, uh, that sort of thing becomes possible. So uh, just like we've seen before, we're just importing uh, the components in this library. And then uh, we created two new components, a, a store component and a provider component. Um, so the store is really simple, similar to what we saw when we created the instance of the store in the previous example. We specify uh, you know, what the Drupal endpoint is. And then any provider inside of that store, um, it's essentially an interface to like that get object uh, request that we saw. So it can use the store uh, to get data and store it. So if we say here that we want to get a node recipe with a specific ID and include uh, additional reference entities on it, you'll see here that we have um, a card that renders out. Um, so yeah, about, about the card. So inside a provider, you can use an HTML template, which we see here. And that can be any valid markup custom elements, anything. So it can be traditional markup, like we see down here. So you, know, you can just use the HTML that you know and love. It could be uh, custom elements from this library. It could be any custom elements. So there's the um, uh, outline uh, library from phase two, which is another set of uh, Drupal-friendly web components. 
There's no reason that you couldn't use the outline components here in the template as well. Um, and then, as you'll see here, in a kind of a twig-like double curly braces syntax, uh, you can reference variables uh, that are uh, within the scope of the provider, and they get rendered out on the screen. So like really simple example, we have a headline here. Um, so we can just say title, and now we get our deep Mediterranean quiche. And then, um, so this is, the, you know, one recipe comes back here. So this is just rendering out one recipe. Um, but if we remove the ID, uh, it will iterate over the template for every result. So now we see all of the recipes on the site. Um, we probably don't need this markup anymore. And then since this is all just an HTML template, uh, we can also do things like, uh, if we wanted to, embed styling in here. So, um, we add some light styling for it to uh, use a grid, so now we have a two-column grid using CSS grid. Um, and then also this library you know, uh, recognizes all of those custom properties, so we can add a few custom properties um, to clean up the cards a little bit, give them a little bit more of a matching style, you know, add, add some flair to them. Um, and all of that really just within markup. So you know, this isn't necessarily the only way that you might want to source data from Drupal to use with these components. Um, but I think it's really cool that you can do all of this kind of inside um, just markup. Um, or you can use these components separately if you wanted to. Um, so yeah, I think we're uh, just about up uh, on time here. So a few last things, you know, uh, thinking of this generic Drupal Web Components project, um, you know, if we wanted this project to be sustainable, um, you know, it really, in my opinion, needs to be a community effort uh, and not a solo project. Um, you know, not just because, uh, you know, I only have so much time to contribute to it, but, but really if this is going to be a thing that is useful to a lot of front-end developers who are using Drupal, it needs to represent the needs of a lot of front-end developers who are using Drupal. Um, there's a meta issue uh, that is just kind of a clearinghouse for components that people might want to see built. Um, there also is, in the library, a uh, scaffolder. Um, probably don't have time to show the example, but you can run npm run create component, and it scaffolds out a component for you that takes advantage of those styling hooks that we talked about. Um, so uh, feel free to just kind of spin it up and experiment. Um, we welcome your contributions, but also, if you're just looking for a way to experiment with uh, web components and lit, uh, might be a decent way to do that as well. Um, and this last thing, so, you know, I think that uh, if this library is able to continue to evolve, I hope that it can be useful. Another area that I think could be uh, a really important offshoot from this work or just work around web components in general uh, that is a pretty hard problem is uh, server-side rendering of web components in PHP. We touched on it a little bit before. Um, you know, these things require JavaScript to mount. Um, you know, it is not, in my opinion, an unreasonable expectation that there will be some functionality on your website that requires JavaScript these days. Um, however, uh, being able to have things server-side rendered so that the, the JavaScript portion is a progressive enhancement is certainly better. Um, and as I mentioned, there's been a lot of work in the Node community um, to be able to solve this problem for JavaScript projects. Um, but I, I don't yet see a clear path to how Drupal can solve this and, and literally render out all of the markup necessary for a web component in its traditional template so that on the initial load, all the stuff is there and then the JavaScript part is progressive enhancement. If we can solve that problem, I think that would be great for Drupal, great for PHP projects in general. Um, so, you know, hopefully more to come there. And, uh, you know, uh, up on time, but definitely want to thank a handful of contributors uh, who contributed to the menu web component as part of the Decoupled Menus Initiative. Uh, we had someone uh, participating in Summer of Code that contributed uh, some new components, uh, others who dropped in and made some useful uh, contributions, people who have made uh, a lot of uh, meaningful uh, improvements to Drupal State, and I probably missed some people. Um, and I mean, everybody here. Thank you for contributing to this that. inspiration. Quiet down.
Um, so yeah, I, I, uh, I'm past time, um, but perhaps uh, if the talk was over and you had questions, we might be able to talk about it. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah, any, uh, any questions? If, uh, if not now, I'll certainly be around the next couple days and would love to talk more. Yes? How do we get involved? Do we go to that meta issue? Yep, yeah, how to get involved. Uh, it, go to that meta issue. So it is a Drupal.org project. It's a general project on Drupal.org, even though it's published on NPM. There's issues in the issue queue, meta issue, great idea to, to throw ideas out there. Uh, as interest has uh, begun to increase, we also have a Slack uh, channel in Drupal Slack. Uh, I think it's just generic Drupal web components. So people are kind of throwing in ideas there or just general web component learnings. Can you throw that uh, QR code back up? Yeah. Love it. Question was, can I throw up the QR code? And the answer is yes. Yes. Are there any accessibility considerations with web components? Uh, yes. Are there any uh, accessibility considerations with web components? Yes, I would say that there are not many that are specific to web components, but uh, a lot of the considerations that you would have to make for accessibility elsewhere apply. So, you know, the markup that you're creating in your web component should be accessible. Um, from a uh, accessibility standpoint, it, there are certainly uh, advantages for the JavaScript piece being a progressive enhancement rather than, you know, the component does not exist until JavaScript loads, um, things like that. But those same sort of problems, you know, exist with the JavaScript frameworks. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not aware of, uh, I might just not be aware of it, but I'm not aware of uh, any web component specific accessibility hurdles. Cool. All right. Thanks, everybody. And yeah, I'll be around. We'd love to talk more. Thank you. Thanks. You're welcome.